and welcome to a top... Atop the fourth wall, where bad comics burn, we continue our look at... SHUT UP ALREADY! Nightmares on Elm Street. <laughs> Last time on Nightmares on Elm Street. Freddy Krueger attacked a woman named Sybil, an old college friend of recurring series protagonist Nancy in her dreams. She sought out Nancy, only to discover her kinda sorta death in the third movie. In reality, she has become a dream counterpoint to Freddy, whatever the hell that means, and is trying to protect the beautiful dream, which is apparently an average suburban home that Freddy cannot enter. Freddy Krueger's one true weakness, home decorating. After meeting with Dr. Neil Gordon, also from the third movie, our heroes learn that Freddy cannot be destroyed, just have his power diminished so that it'll take him a while to come back. And so they bravely confront Freddy, only to then haul ass when they see him. Brave so long and run away. No! Bravely ran away, away. I didn't! It's also revealed that Sybil is pregnant from her dead husband, and that children's souls or something hang out in a dream meadow before they're born, despite not having the concept of grass yet. In the end, Sybil was confronted by Jack the Ripper for some reason. Also, Freddy killed a woman with a sewing machine. SEWING MACHINE! I am also trapped in my office, since every time I open the door, some new horror awaits me. And the last time I tried to leave despite that, well... YOU'RE HERE FOREVER! I have a bit of a headache from that one. In the meantime, though, let's dig into Nightmares on Elm Street number three and number four and see where this comic is going, since I'm certainly not going anywhere. Issue 3's cover is pretty good, but yet again, we have some uncanny valley with how people are drawn. Freddy this time is fine, a bit over the top, but at least both top and bottom teeth are showing. What's not so good is the demonic mirror here, showing two extremes of a woman holding a little kid. In the mirror, the kid is apparently missing all his skin. Clive Barker's It's Hell Raising Kids. However, apparently seeing himself without skin just bores the child, while the woman is making the same porn face that Sue Storm made in that one Greg Land page. We open on... some new pencils. Yes, for some reason, for the rest of the miniseries, we've lost the painted artwork of Tony Harris and have instead gotten Patrick Rollo. I actually find this to be an improvement. While Harris's artwork was great for the dream sequences, I'd rather have a more general comic book look, if that makes any sense, for the overall book, since making the real world stuff appear too surreal, stiff, or just otherwise bizarre kind of takes away from the overall experience. Rolo's art here seems to resemble the stuff Neil Adams was doing over at Now Comics. I like it. It's clean and simple. Anyway, we truly open with Sarah Connors here driving along the road at the end of the Terminator. Six years. I haven't been back here for six years. I've still got that library book. This is the Dream Master Alice from the fourth and fifth movies. She's the Dream Master because... Uh... I don't know, in the fourth movie she absorbed all her dead friend's dream powers into herself, I guess, and she recited a plagiarized version of Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep. 
Alice herself is a fine character. I like her arc and development, it's just the movies themselves are a bit head-tilting in their logic. Like the aforementioned, unborn, freshly conceived children have dreams thing from part 5. Speaking of, the product of that movie is with her. Her son Jacob. Jacob never knew his father. Eh, just tell him he became Ghost Rider. It's not too far off. When are we going to be home, mother? When are you gonna use question marks? When we're done here, dear, Mommy's gotta take care of Granddad's things and then we'll go back. That's not what I meant. I meant Springwood. Dear, that's not our home. You haven't even been here since you were born. We aren't going to stay, baby. Oh. Okay, Alice, your kid who palled around with Freddy Krueger before he was born is being creepy and referring to a place he shouldn't remember as home. Maybe you should have found a sitter. Alice's father has passed away, so she has to go back to Springwood to handle his affairs. And it actually feels like from this artwork that we're in a bit of a transition between movies 5 and 6. At the beginning of Freddy's Dead, it said it took place 10 years in the future, and Springwood's entire child population was dead, the town had fallen into disrepair, and the only people still there were suffering from a little case of cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Fortunately, by the time Freddy vs. Jason came around, the place had completely turned itself around, teenagers sprung out of nowhere, and everything was A-OK. -okay. This is why elections are so important, especially when you run on an anti-Freddy Krueger platform. I mean, before the new mayor showed up, this Elm Street sign had Freddy slash marks on it. With some city ordinances, this never happened again. Also, when the hell did Freddy do that? This page also informs us that this is Loose Ends Part 1, Return to Springwood. Okay, I've been operating under the impression that this comic is a mini-series, but was it actually supposed to be an ongoing? Is that why the art change? Like I've said before, it's hard to get information about stuff like this for smaller independent companies, so I'm not sure what's going on. Anyway, Alice arrives at her old house and is greeted by a blonde woman. Sorry to hear about Fred's accident. All us around here have all been broken up about it. Doesn't seem as if there are that many people left in the neighborhood to know him. Well, admittedly, the neighborhood association meetings will be a little lonelier now that it's just me and my cat, but at least referendums will be passed faster. Hey, little fella. You're a cute one. What's your name? And the kid has no skin. Jacob Daniel Johnson. KFC proudly presents the new skinless Jacob combo meal. So yeah, the lady named, uh, lady doesn't mention that Jacob looked like an underripe prune and our heroes excuse themselves so Alice can practice being a rubber bendy doll in this panel. Alice sees ghostly images of the movies playing out, basically just remembering all her dead friends and family. It's quite heartwarming, actually. A reminder that these deaths mattered to the main character, and they weren't just kill fodder for Freddy, even though they technically were. She breaks down a bit and hugs Jacob, who apparently was able to see the same ghostly images. There wasn't anyone there, Jacob. Mommy was just remembering things. I was remembering them with you. Jacob, you shouldn't be doing that. You know what I told you about what happens sometimes in people's minds. So Jacob has shining powers? Holy crap. Freddy vs. The Shining! Why aren't there more versus movies? Jacob reveals that he also read the mind of that woman they met and that her name is Devon. And I want you to stay away from Devon if she comes around here. She makes me feel... creepy. The woman who offered condolences about your dad was creepy, but your psychic son who refers to you as mother is perfectly okay? We cut over to Dr. Gordon as he wanders around a hospital. Someone comes up to him and asks for help with a patient who's injured himself. And we know the situation is serious because of all the pink smoke in the halls. They need help with a patient who has cut off his own eyelids to keep himself from going to sleep. Gruesome, yes, but he has a bright future ahead of himself in championship staring contests. The guy screams that Freddy is here, something Dr. Gordon reinforces. And the other doctors suddenly grab Gordon and strap him to the table, revealing one of the surgeons to be Freddy, so this is a nightmare. Again, kudos to this issue. Despite the pink smoke, because of the presence of that guy who cut off his own eyelids, the comic did fool me into thinking this was the real world again. Dr. Kruger, do we need to sedate Dr. Gordon? Oh yes! We'll put him to sleep! Permanently! Freddy, that doesn't make any sense. You're not a veterinarian in this dream. And Freddy, this is not Inception. He's already asleep. We also see that the orderly assisting Freddy is Taryn, again from Nightmare 3. 
Good to see she had a career after Freddy killed her. She tries to put a glove on Freddy's hand for the operation, but of course it tears because of his knives. Oh, what a shame! No safe slashing without latex! Well, then enjoy your malpractice lawsuit, Freddy. Was that supposed to be a condom joke? Freddy, you're all over the place with this one. Before Freddy can slash him, however, two glowing arms reach up from the bed and cop a feel on Dr. Gordon. We cut back to the real world, the actual one this time, where we see that Dr. Gordon is actually in a coma. Here we meet with Yvonne, a supporting character in the fifth movie who's best friends with Alice. Speaking of, the two reunite and Alice admits she's having trouble with coming back to Springwood after, you know, the whole all their friends and loved ones died and she's a single mother and her dad just died too thing. However, Yvonne also tells us that apparently the last two issues happened three years ago. He was in a car accident three years ago. It was a double tragedy, actually. He had just come from a woman's house who had died from eclampsia. That's a complication of pregnancy when he had the wreck. Yeah, spoilers, um, Sybil's dead. And she never appears in the book again. Not even mentioned after this. Killed off panel, in fact. Thanks for wasting our time for two issues. Now, to be fair, the more I thought about it, the series has done this before. In three movies, we followed someone for a bit who we were led to believe was the main character, but then they're killed off. Except, one, they still interacted with the actual main character before that point. Alice is now technically the main character here, and she will never hear Sybil's name. Two, there wasn't as much setup for those main characters. In those two issues, we were given her friends, the unborn daughter, the Jack the Ripper stuff. Hell, the Jack the Ripper ending is now just completely gone and nonsensical. I'm sure you could claim it was Freddy, but why bother with the human-looking face when he was perfectly happy to chase her as himself in the opening pages? Basically given lots of plot lines that are never resolved or followed up on for the rest of the mini. And three, basically those two issues are completely unnecessary. All the information about the beautiful dream, Nancy and Neil stuff, Kruger as an unstoppable force, yeah, all that is repeated in these next issues, so you could basically jump into this from issue three and not be lost as long as you've seen the movies before. It's rare for a comic to render an entire third of its story completely pointless, but you pulled it off, Nightmares on Elm Street. Great job. I can't get over this. It's frustrating as hell to think of how none of that mattered. I just don't understand. Did they get bored with the story at that point and decide to call a do-over? Anyway, Dr. Gordon has been in a coma for the last three years, occasionally coming close to coming out, but ultimately going back in. Jacob uses his psychic powers to reveal that he's happy in there most of the time, and that Nancy is keeping him safe from Freddy. This causes Alice and Yvonne to express... No surprise! <sighs> we cut over to Devon as she picks up a football player by the side of the road, and also seeing him as if he forgot to put his skin on today. She seduces him, and then bashes his head in with a hammer. Also, the sound of a hammer cracking a guy's skull open is... Pits she also gets a good taste of blood and brain food. Mmm, tastes like grape jelly and mustard. She performs a ritual with candles in the body, basically so that his soul will go over to Freddy, hoping to control her dreams that night. Some people use hypnotism to become lucid dreamers. Others use ritualistic murder. Back over to our heroes, Alice tucks Jacob into bed, and Yvonne points out how weird Jacob is acting, calling her mother and being super serious. Alice fears that the events of the fifth film and Freddy's influence on him in the womb may have affected him. Also, the mind-reading thing. I know this is gonna sound dumb, but he can see into people's minds. He's... psychic. Girl, we fought some guy in the dream world who's been dead for 20 years, and you're saying it's gonna sound dumb that your kid's psychic? No, but it is dumb when Freddy bakes souls into a pizza. When Alice explains that she plans to sell her father's house, Yvonne states that might be tricky. Someone's been going around murdering kids, and it's been happening when people are awake, so it's unlikely to be Freddy. You might be mad at me for suggesting this, but with his powers, maybe he can help find this killer. No! Hmm, your word balloon says angry and dismissive, but your face says... Eh... 
Over in Dreamland, Devon goes into the power plant boiler room, whatever, that Freddy had, even passing the human-faced dog from Nightmare 2, one of the few references to that film made in the franchise. Anyway, she makes out with Freddy for a bit, and then she's attacked by goddessy-level bad artwork. I mean, wow! I don't doubt Devon wants to rub her ass on Freddy, but her stance does not imply that's what she's intending to do. When Freddy disappears, she walks into another room, only to emerge outside a house, which explodes. And in the flaming wreckage emerges this lady. I love you, Devon. Okay, a bit more obscure, but I'd settle for Freddy versus Vapora too. Freddy informs Devon that she's not done her work yet and he needs her to bring him someone. Meanwhile, Alice falls asleep and apparently the Roadrunner is signaling her. But no, in this pink smoke dream, she sees Jacob's father, Dan, arriving to pick her up on his motorcycle. They start driving towards Jacob, who's standing in the middle of the road. Ten points for a five-year-old. Only ten? Pfft. Lamest Grand Theft Auto game ever. Alice redirects the bike not to hit their son, and she's thrown off, now seeing both Freddy and Daniel as he looked when he died in his dream. And I'm sorry, I forgot. He didn't turn into Ghost Rider, he turned into a Predator. I killed you! I got better! Freddy, you are really just not trying anymore, are you, man? Jacob uses his psychic powers to blow Freddy and his dad up, but good, encouraging his injured mother to sleep. And so our comic ends with Devon showing up to take Jacob away, but he's already awake and waiting for her, volunteering to go with her so they can see his father. Issue 4's cover is... yeesh. I like it in concept, but the actual artwork is so stiff. Jacob and Alice are hiding behind Dan's gravestone, where an arm is emerging from the grave, Freddy is stalking them, and Jacob is wearing a burlap sack for some reason. I guess that's because it's what he wore in the dream world before he was born, but he's unrecognizable otherwise, so why bother? It's not like he's wearing that anymore. Also, Alice's head was apparently replaced with a creepy mannequin. The blackest eyes. The devil's eyes. We open with Devon driving Jacob to the cemetery, although there's more pink smoke, which should be an indicator that this is a dream, but it is not. When Jacob points out that they're getting close, Devon is confused because he said he'd never been there before. I know, that's all. The most underrated of psychic abilities, instant Google Maps. You don't need to talk funny to me. I know what you really sound like. What do you mean, sugar? You aren't from the South. You just talk that way sometimes to trick people. Well, drat, kiddo. Guess I couldn't hide my real Minnesotan accent around you there. Yup, you betcha. You're one smart fish, I'll tell you. Ooh, my, it's just so ding-dang cold around here. That's different. You don't really like me either. That's okay. You will. And he's smiling. Okay, you know how I said he was acting creepy before when he wasn't smiling? I take that back. He's far creepier when he smiles. You can stop that, Jacob. Arriving at the cemetery, Jacob quickly finds his father's grave, allowing us a chance to look at his pajamas, featuring a totally not copyrighted character that destroyed my former video host. Then we cut over to Alice. And this is Alice. Thank you, narrator. I would have been completely confused without your assistance. She quickly discovers that Jacob is missing and collapses outside in her underwear. Jacob! Yes! Remember earlier how I said I actually preferred this artwork? Yeah, I may have to reevaluate that. It goes more and more 90s as the comic goes on. Sure, it's still better than early image. We're not gonna see a super beefy Freddy. Super Freddy! In the comic, I mean. But the women are becoming increasingly incapable of standing up straight, instead preferring to curve themselves into a sideways W. Back over to Jacob, he yells at Devon to go away, telling her that she has a family in the cemetery to visit too. Jacob fails to make contact with his dead father, because despite being psychic, he is not a particularly smart child. However, he also spots Devon rapidly talking to herself concerning her parents, before her head explodes or something. I don't know, maybe that's supposed to be all the pain she's feeling from her spine cracking like that. I mean, ouch, that is some Ultimates 3 level spinal contortion right there. 
Jacob travels into Devon's memories, revealing that her father was severely abusive, to the point where he accidentally killed Devon's sister, Denise. Somehow, this does not land him in prison, so Devon just turns on the gas line and lets her mom lighting a cigarette blow them up. I should point out that the mom was clearly abused as well, so that's kind of a bummer. So, to take ourselves away from that real-world kind of crappiness, enjoy this clip from Freddy's Nightmares. <laughs> It's time for our boy to face the music with Rap Master Ready. And hey, Jacob's in some kind of astral form during this, and he tries to attack the abusive father, showing the most human-like behavior I've seen out of him so far. We also reveal that the skinless thing is actually meant to be Burns, as Devon's completely burnt mother escapes the house before dying. And she was also apparently a neighbor to the Krugers. So yeah, there's another added layer of creepiness to their relationship. Freddy knew Devon as a little kid. And of course, this is also somewhat of a dream, so her mother's corpse starts talking to her. You need to be punished! Just wait until your father gets here! Oh, don't worry, Mom. They're bringing him right here from over there. And there. And there. I think that's his foot right there. Back in the real world, Alice is reporting Jacob's disappearance to the police, but they're overworked with all the other disappearances and murders. Alice wonders why there isn't any outside help coming to deal with the crisis. We've asked for help, but we don't seem to get it. Springwood's like a black hole sometimes. So Freddy has power over the FBI? How high does this conspiracy go? It's something that bugs me about the franchise sometimes. How much power he actually seems to possess over the real world. The guy is only supposed to have power in dreams. That's the entire reason why Nancy and Maggie in the movies tried to drag him out of the dream. In the real world, he's just some asshole with knives duct taped to a glove. How the hell is he keeping cars from coming in and crap? Anyway, Yvonne shows up and, dear lord, it looks like someone took her character model and stretched it vertically. Not helped by this next panel where she, too, is doing the goddessy pose of her spine going 90 degrees to push her ass out behind her. Back in the dream world, Freddy has met up with Jacob. Come on, Jacob! I've got something to show you! It's this really funny YouTube video, Jacob! I bet it becomes a meme! Where are we going? Into my playground. Freddy's playground is truly a thing of nightmares. It lacks a swing set. I want to show you what kind of toys I play with. So anyway, here's my leader class Optimus Prime. Cool, huh? Just lay on the pedophile vibes more, Freddy. I know you were intended to be a child molester, but it was never actually stated in the films you were one, so this is just icky. He leads Jacob to the junkyard he was buried in in part three and then into a car trunk. This is the back way in! This is a weird remake of Chronicles of Narnia. And inside is... uh... dolls? Sorta naked blue body suspended everywhere? Skeleton dude in the back? And the demonic wheelchair from a dream in part three? Good times. Welcome to Wonderland! And yet still not as joyless and murky as Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. Welcome to my nightmares. Logically, if these are your nightmares, shouldn't that mean you're scared of all of this? Or are you afraid that all the blue naked bodies make the place look tacky and that's what you're afraid of? Freddy explains that all the bodies in the place, and in the walls, are Springwood's dreamers. That for some reason the place has had tons and tons of unusual sleep disorders even before he came around. That the town is living in a nightmare that he controls. Bit of an unnecessary contrivance if you ask me. Why does this need to be overcomplicated? Freddy's a sadist who attacks people in their dreams. Done. This isn't Silent Hill. Why does the whole town need to be messed up in some way? Jacob asks why the hell he should help Freddy. You hurt people. But you don't have any great love for people, do you, Jacob? You know what they're really like inside. What they whisper in their minds. Which makes it okay for me to stab them. And because that's bullcrap, even if he did believe people sucked, Freddy offers a better incentive, his father. While Dan and Jacob go off to do some bonding, Freddy gets Devon and orders her to kill Alice and anyone with her. When she awakens, we can see that her stomach is... Well, maybe the artist should have paid attention to how thin her stomach is versus how to position her ass at the camera. 
Also, Devon owns an Uzi. She's able to track down Alice and Yvonne thanks to a note Alice left at her place in case Jacob came back, and we cut over to our heroes on their way back to the hospital. Yvonne figures that Dr. Gordon is their best chance now. She recalls that Jacob said Nancy was protecting Dr. Gordon and explains about Nancy having fought Freddy before. And so our comic ends with the two arriving at Dr. Gordon's bed and exclaiming out loud that Freddy has Jacob which, for some reason, wakes him up. These comics are... eh, once again, but leaning more towards suck. I've got to admit, the comics are starting to lose me. Aside from the fact that we might as well be in a new miniseries altogether after the now useless first two issues, the new artwork at first seemed like a welcome change, but instead is embracing awful drawings of women, not to mention some pretty bad facial expressions. The story is okay for the most part. Some of it is bridging Nightmares 5 and 6, some of it has good character bits for Alice, and the idea of Freddy having an accomplice in the waking world is something new for the series. This book is still not good, but I don't know yet if I can qualify it as all that bad. Next time, we conclude this mini-series... Shut up, shut up, shut up! When Kara let us in! We've been doing that for hours. It's not going to work with the state he's in. At least then we're doing something. Nims, any luck with the force field? Nimue is directing all her attention to bring down the force field, but it's in place by protected backup systems. She's unable to gain access. Probably because it was designed that way. Ningseno, any progress on the teleport? I've been over it six times. There just isn't a way to narrow the teleport beam enough to pierce the force field. Maybe if you had asked that Sierra computer how he did it. Well, I didn't. But here's an idea. Prove you're smarter than that ENIAC ripoff ever was. You again. Yeah. Sarahs, I don't think the cloaking device is working anymore. You got five seconds to tell us what the hell you did to Linkara, lady. What? What have you done to Linkara? No idea what you're talking about. I'm just here for the coin. Forgive me if I seem suspicious when there's crap going on with the kid in the other room. What stuff? Nankara began a review of some Nightmare on Elm Street comics. Then his office got locked, and from our surveillance, we know something's happening to him. Reviewing? Oh, he's an internet reviewer, right? Yeah, so? Well, it's October and he's doing a horror review. This sort of thing happens all the time to internet reviewers. If he's reviewing A Nightmare on Elm Street, then he's probably having a nightmare where he fights Freddy Krueger. It's one of our oldest tropes. Hasn't this sort of thing happened on his show before? Technically, yes. So, all you have to do is let it play out. He'll fight Freddy, and everything will work out. Nice theory, but there's a little bit of a problem with it. What's that? He's not asleep. What? We've got surveillance on the kid. He's not asleep. He's wide awake.
And now, a word from one of our sponsors. Corpse Corp is a high-concept slasher comic series I've been working on for the course of the last year or so. Essentially, how it functions is it takes just as much inspiration from the iconic 80s franchise masked killer slasher movies that you would come to know from this kind of project, but also takes just as much inspiration from the more nuanced, newer, and more self-aware projects of more recent years, such as Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, the Cabin in the Woods, and the late Wes Craven Scream franchise. Using a similar concept to Cabin in the Woods, Corpse Corp is a project that takes the idea of having a business side to the world of horror movies and having the killers themselves actually having some sort of a corporate atmosphere, sort of a halfway between Cabin in the Woods and Monsters, Inc. in some sort of weird way, where we follow a new guy in the company named Jack who is trying to bring this more new bread company back to its slasher 80s, get your hands dirty, bloody roots. And essentially, in order to accomplish this, he's assigned to a camp project where, in the same tune as some other famous horror franchises, follows a group of dumb, innocent teenagers, or in this case, not so innocent teenagers, as they stumble upon their first week of training as camp counselors at Camp Carpenter. What I think makes Corpse Corp interesting as a project and sets it aside from other projects is that one, the slasher genre is really not something that gets explored that often in comic books, but also two, I believe that there's still so much with the self-aware angle that hasn't been explored yet. When you look at things like the scary movie franchise and stuff like that, they focus so much on just pure referential humor and no one tries to really dissect into what actually makes these horror tropes work and how much you can actually play with that kind of thing and expand upon things that haven't been done in this genre before. One of the main things that we use to accomplish this effect is Jack's slasher identity is a character called the Swing Time Slasher, which is more of a zoot suit wearing, out of control, you know, surround himself with lights, announce all of his entrances, wacky, out of control, villain more than the more slow and silent, big walking, slow walking type of slasher villains that were known out of this genre. And we're having a lot of fun with this and seeing how we can experiment with having the perspective of this be completely from the side of the killer rather than from the counselors. The art for this series is going to be done by the team of Tyler and Sarah Sowles. They've done some amazing work in the past. They've actually even been recently successful on Kickstarter over doubling their goal for Durantis issue 2 and being the head writer of the series you'll see some of my credentials below including my recently successful Kickstarter for the man who watched Batman volume 1. There's a lot of really interesting rewards and tiers and you can get from this project including getting your own copy of the comic book, copies of my book The Man Who Watched Batman Volume 1, various artists who've donated their time and even some of them their cameos to being inside of this project including a cameo by Comfort and Adam from the Rainbow in the Dark series and a cameo of a major role played by Dirk Manning himself from Nightmare World and Tales of Mystery. One of my favorite rewards we get to include is the ability to be included inside of Corpse Corp. You can be a background character inside the worlds of the company itself. You can be featured as one of the movie posters that's featured around the company of a previous project before that will be drawn by our artist. Or, my favorite donation is that you can have the opportunity for you to be brutally mortared in the hands of one of our Corpse Corp employees inside of the comic book itself. This project will go on until November 6th, and I really encourage you to donate to this project. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and I really think that Corpse Corp will be something really amazing that we can put together. Thanks all of you for your patronage. Share this project with your friends. Donate what you can. Spread the word best you can. And I will see you next time. Thank you very much.